So I think tonight is absolutely apropos being the anniversary, the Hilula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to have the Kabbalah of happiness because Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was the first one to say that on his passing, it should be a day of celebration, a day of happiness. And what a polar opposite, what a diametrically opposed idea of happiness and mourning and a day of passing. So it's a really great segue into our talk tonight. We're talking about the Kabbalah of happiness. And my first question for you is, are you happy? You can unmute yourself, not everybody at once. I think that being happy isn't about all the time. I think it's about points in the day. Okay. So you have a specific way of defining your happiness. Rabbi, do you think happiness is something you pursue? Good question. Good Jewish question. You answer with a question. Happiness is something you pursue. I think it is. Yeah, it's possible. <clears throat> how, how would you define happiness? If you had to define it in one word or in two words, how would you define happiness? Anyone? Okay. I won't, uh, I won't press you. So I want you to think about May it. I? Yes, please. I think it's a, it's a point of balance. It, it's an emotion with a point of balance and it's, it's a choice that you make to achieve, you know, like um, her friend was talking about pursuing, but we're, we're, it, it's a balance that we need to find and we need to maintain and it comes from within. It's great. I, I think uh, happiness is actually fleeting. Um, in answer to the question that you asked, I would say I am contented. Contented, I like that word. Right. There are things that would make me emotionally happy, mm -hmm. but I don't need to have those things happen in my life to be, to be contented, to be satisfied with life. You know, so I see happiness as being based on things that happen that would cause an emotional change, as opposed to be contented regardless of what happens. And it's not being ethereal, but that's just how I see things. It's great. It's a great, great food for thought. What do you think the difference between joy and happiness is? Well, I think joy is very, it's fleeting, it's momentary. It's, 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 like a, it's, it's like a high on a graph, but happiness is a more constant state in my mind anyway. Like okay. Where regardless of how high or low you are, it's sort of the norm that you come back to. It goes up and down, whereas happiness stays pretty much plateau. Uh, for some reason, joy feels closer to Hashem. I don't know. I don't okay. know why I'm. I don't know why I'm okay. saying that, but yeah. It seems like just a word, but if you are getting that feeling, that's great. So, part of what we're going to talk about tonight is differentiating joy and happiness. And I think that if you come out of tonight's talk with a proper definition of the difference between joy and happiness, I'll consider this a success. And I hope you'll come out with some other stuff as well. Here's my next question. If I'm going to say something, I'd like you to finish my sentence. The secret to staying happy is... What you enjoy. Mm -hmm. Doing what you enjoy. Doing what you enjoy. Okay. Activity, like being positive. Being positive. Looking at things in the in a positive way. I like that. Looking at things in a positive way. Not to ask for too much. Not asking for too much. Knowing Keep your expectations low. Knowing very deeply that every single thing that is happening is for your spiritual evolution. That's it. Knowing Regardless of the sensation. 
regardless of the sensation. Absolutely. It's all for your spiritual advancement, for your ability to, uh, to move forward. Love it. I think it's an acceptance of where you are in life. Um, you know, it's still attempting to improve, but accepting your situation and realizing that it's not so bad, you know? So perspective. It's looking at your situation, maybe from a different lens. You know, we are the masters of our own narrative. We are the masters of our own perspective. And so looking at your perspective through a lens that maybe you haven't looked at it before. Let's go to our books if you have your book, page 14. Are we really happy? Or are we just resigned to our lot? At some point, we just say, as the Mishnah says, who is really happy? One who's happy with what they have. One who's happy with their lot. Because being happy with what you have, says the Mishnah, that's true happiness. Happiness, according to Kabbalah, is an emotional state we achieve when we find ourselves in an ideal situation. The more ideal the situation and the longer we have dreamed of the opportunity, the happier we are. Conversely, we're saddened when we're denied our dreams when our state of affairs leaves what to be desired. So how do we know when we're happy? One of the great, I would say, existential questions. Is it good to be happy? Is the secret always being happy? Someone said there's extremes. Is the secret challenging ourselves to grow, to become better, to become stronger? Maybe the secret is faith. Maybe the secret is giving, giving to others. Maybe the secret is being able to receive. A lot of people have a difficult time receiving. Some have an easy time giving and a hard time receiving, and some have an easy time receiving and a hard time giving. Maybe the secret is growing, constantly striving to be better. Is the secret maybe support? It says you know a person by the people they surround themselves with. The, the Talmud says, Ola Rasha Ola Shchono, we know who a person is based on the people that they are around. Do we have good support around us? Now more than ever during this time, we're thinking about what kind of support we have around us. Do we have good friends? The Mishnah says, Asei lecharav kana lecha chaver. It says, acquire for yourself a rabbi, kana, buy for yourself a friend. It's so important to have a friend that you need to buy your friend. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Just a little opening class meditation. Deep breath in through your nose, and then out through your mouth. In through your nose, and then a deep breath out. And when you breathe out, I want you to breathe out everything that's holding you back. All the parts of your life that are stopping you. I want you to envision your fantasy life. What would your fantasy life include if you had everything? What would your fantasy life include 
if you had everything you wanted, if money wasn't an issue, if you won the lottery today, if there were absolutely no limitations, if who you are, your nurture, your nature, absolutely no limitations. The sky is the limit. What would that be? What would you want? Would you want more money? Would you want a nicer home? Would it be more self-discipline? Would it be more vacations? Better health? Better relationships? I want you to think about it physically. Think about it emotionally. Think about it spiritually. What would your fantasy life look like? Whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. And if you have a paper or your computer or phone in front of you, write down what's the first thing that comes to your mind. Just write it down, whatever it is. Anyone want to share? Gmilut Hasadim. Very, very happy. In what context? Well, I mean, I have, I have my own personal preferences. Um, uh, you know, helping the very poor uh, and um, and orphan children. Mm -hmm. So Gmilut Hasadim, um, for those of you who don't know, means loving kindness. Right. So you're saying the poor and orphan children. Yeah, and and um, dis the disenfranchised women, like the, the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? I wrote yeah. peace. Oh, okay, Alessandro, go ahead. Sorry, I wrote peace. Peace. Okay. Dennis. Yeah, mine has been, and I'm, and I have been aware of this for, for quite a while, is to be the catalyst to help everyone who I meet to achieve and live and maximize the potential that they were given from, you know, from Hashem. That's amazing. That's great. Anyone else? Thought, the power of thought. Kabbalah says, thought creates. The power of our thinking, we think. What is it? It's just thought. No one knows what I'm thinking. Whatever I think, that's mine. <laughs> what I say, what I do, people will know. But at least I want something that's truly me. There was once a great master. His name was the Baal Shem Tov. He was the founder of the Hasidic movement. He was sitting in the study room and all his students were sitting there in the study hall. And he hears one of his students screaming across the study hall. I'm gonna tear you apart like a fish. He's upset at his friend. He puts up his hands and all the studying stops. And he says to his students, come around, come around. They each put their hands on one another's shoulder. They close their eyes and suddenly they're able to envision the students related, how this man was actually ripping the other person apart like a fish in the heavens. They open their eyes and the Baal says to them, what you say is so powerful that it really happens in the heavens. 
the power of our words. We all know the power of our actions. It's obvious. If you take a room and you want to paint it, the action of painting the room, when you're done, the room is a different color. So most of the time, what we do, we can see the fruits of our labor. We're using our hands. But our words, so often we use them carelessly. So the Baal Shem Tov was saying something so profound, something that maybe his students had never heard before. The power of words in the heavens. Words are able to create. And then the Baal Shem Tov finishes. And he says, if that's the power of actions, if that's the power of words, how much stronger is the power of thoughts? That thoughts truly create. So if we're going to think that we can't, it's not possible, then it won't be possible. We're going to manifest those thoughts. And I'm sure this is not something you're hearing for the first time right now. It's so common today. It's almost like a mantra of the self-help world. Thoughts create. I mean, every motivational speaker is talking about the power of thoughts and that thoughts create your reality. But tonight, I'd like to take it a whole step further. We're going to talk about the power of thoughts in a very different way. Do you believe me? If I tell you that your fantasy life, whatever you wrote down on the paper, whatever you thought in your mind during that meditation earlier, it can come true. I'm telling you that it's possible. All those dreams, those ideas that you've had for years or even for moments, they're all possible. And I'm going to tell you the secret of how it's going to become true. So for those of you who have been following the Kabbalah of love and then the Kabbalah of money, and now this is the third week, I'm going to continue and add on to what we've learned. If you weren't able to follow it, that's fine too. You'll get an appreciation for it as well. But for those of you who've been following, you're going to hear a lot of the same things, but a step further in a different light. So let's move on where we left off last week. Your thoughts can only come true if you have a vessel that can hold it. You've had a week to think about your vessels. Are you just remembering now the intense class that we had last week? You can hold as much water as the cup holds. Your, your fantasy life will only come true if you have the ability to hold that fantasy life. You see, I'd be wrong to say that thoughts alone are enough. Your thoughts alone are not good enough. Sorry. Your thoughts are amazing. Your thoughts can manifest. But I would be remiss if I wouldn't tell you that thoughts alone are not able to create. You need to have something in this world. Kabbalah says our job is to make this world a better place, to live in this world. Thoughts are not going to do it alone. We need to have a vessel, something in this world that's going to be able to hold those thoughts. You have big fantasies. You have big ideas. No problem. Get a big cup. <laughs> Get a barrel. If you need a barrel to hold all your ideas, get a barrel. Your fantasies will all come true, but you need to make sure you have something to hold it. And this works for everything in life. Let's, let's take relationships, for example. Let's bring it into relationships. If you, if you think about your whole list, all the things that you dream about your partner being or that you want your partner to be if you're in a relationship. And then you think about the list and you find that person. You have to ask yourself what I believe is the most powerful question. 
Are you a complement to the person you're looking for? Can you, the person you are, be in a relationship with the person you want? You need to be the complement of that person. And if you're not, no problem, become it. Or become realistic. Which means if you're not willing to be the complement of the person you want, and you're not willing to do the work to get there, if you aren't there already, then you have to either decide that that person that you want is really not for you, because you're not the complement of that person, or that you're unrealistic. Life, especially relationships, take two. If you can't handle the person you're looking for, what are you looking for? And you can literally take this example into every aspect of your life. I just gave you one example, but just apply it to, to everything. You need to be the complement. You need to be the person who can handle that particular thing. You have to put yourself in a position to be able to handle that. Back to the text. I love to meet the person who'd honestly say, my fantasy life, I'm living it. I can't imagine a thing that I would want to change. Do you want to be the person who says, my life is so perfect, I don't want to change a thing? Do you want to be that person? I'd like to keep working on it forever and ever because it's never going to actually get there and stop. Mm. <laughs> you know, but uh, I want to. I want to keep part working one. on. Oh, great sage! But wouldn't it? Would it mean being contented with the life that you are living at the moment? Very good. Knowing that this is what Hashem wants you to experience, and everything He does is good. Very good. So we live moment by moment by moment. Ah, you caught my trap. Knowing that Hashem is in control and He's in charge, and this is the life he wants me to live. So I'm, hey, I'm living my, my fantasy life. Exactly. Well done. Well said. Anyone else? So exactly what Michael and Dennis said. I was trying to set you up there. You guys are too smart for me. Kabbalah doesn't, want a person to stay stagnant. It, Kabbalah doesn't want a person to say, I'm living the ideal life, because in life, we're either going up or we're going down. We're never stagnant. We're never going to stay the same. We're never going to plateau. If we're not consciously rising, then we're passively moving lower. There's a lot of people who think that they're staying in one place. They're like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm okay. It's all good. But they're really passively going lower and they don't realize it. A year later, two years later, they look around and they ask, what happened to me? I thought I was a nice person. I thought I was a good person. And, and all the things that you used to think were good. And you look at some of those things that you're doing and you're saying, what happened to me? What happened to me is I wasn't growing. Kabbalah wants us to constantly be striving for better, striving for more. I think the Rebbe embodied that so well. If somebody would come and say, I did this, and the Rebbe said, okay, and why not more? One of my favorite uh, uh, little interviews is the, the Jewish federations in North America came to visit the Rebbe. And uh, one of the representatives says, Rabbi, I'd like to let you know that we are now giving a quarter of a million dollars to the Chabad education system. 
And the Rebbe looks at him with a straight face and says, and you expect me to be satisfied with a quarter million dollars? And he says in return, well, if you were satisfied, then uh, I'd be worried. So in those words, ask yourself, you expect me to be satisfied where I am today? You expect me to be satisfied doing what I'm doing today? That the purpose of life is not to get to a place where things are easy. If anyone ever told you that the purpose of life was to get to a place where things are easy, they are wrong. That is not the purpose. That's not what we're striving for. It's a mistake. And it's hurting a lot of people because a lot of people look at people who they call quote unquote successful and they say, that's my goal. I want to be like that person. My goal is to just be in a place where I don't have to worry about money anymore, where I can get out of the rat race. The secret is though, you're gonna worry about something. It may sound good to be in that place, whatever that place is, but it's not reality because the moment you're in that place, you're gonna wish you were in another place and it's gonna keep on going and going and going. King Solomon says, it's harder to be a rich person than a poor person. He says a rich person worries much more than a poor person. So Kabbalah wants us to constantly be growing, be in an upward motion, doing something. And it doesn't have to be everything. It just has to be something. A little bit better today than I was yesterday. That's it. It doesn't have to be changing the face of the human race. Relax. Balance. We'll talk about that next week. Balance. It's a slow process. Little by little. So the point is that you work little by little. And then when you look back two years from now, you say, wow, did I change? Those little steps every single day for two years, they're going to amount into something absolutely incredible. And as long as you're constantly in this upward spiral, constantly growing, you have the idea. Don't look at, yeah, it's nice to have a goal. I'm not saying don't have a goal, but you want to look at where am I going? And just today, today, tomorrow, I'm going to go to sleep tonight. And I want to make sure that I'm set up that tomorrow I can be a little better. I can grow a little more. Now my next question. Is true happiness possible? Is it possible for us to get to a place where we're just happy, where we're truly happy? Is it possible? Depends on your version of happiness. Great, great. Depends on your version of happiness. Anyone else? Well, again, I think the statistics come. Okay, Alan. Go ahead. I was going back to what I was saying before a lot of it is also where your willingness to accept where you are, right? If you're if you accept your position, I don't mean like accepting the fact that my life sucks and because of that I'm happy. I mean, you're, you've reached a point where you're, you're accepting the situation, accepting the situation we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. uh, then, yeah, it is possible to be truly happy. It doesn't mean that you, you know, once you've attained that happiness, that's it. There's no more room for growth and you stop. But if you can get up in the morning and say, you know what, yeah, I'm happy. You know, it's, it's, it's exactly what I think. You accept where you are, your willingness to accept even the situation. I think it's a great, a great uh, answer. Dennis? Being in Hashem's will is, is pure happiness. Well, if, if you see it that way, if you can yeah. kind of put, put aside all the, the downs of uh, being in isolation and uh, et cetera, et cetera, yes. But that's his will. Yes. That's his will. He knew this was going to happen. Yeah, it's true. And happiness is not a matter of being bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. It's mm -hmm. a matter of knowing that he is in control. And again, if he is in control, and I can relate to that, well, then that ought to make me happy. That's because great. he's in control. That's great.
Michael? Yeah, you know, I think, I think that it's important to, at least for me, the way that I live, I try to separate my state and the emotions. Because the emotions come and go. But, but if I'm sovereign, and that's more and more that I'm connected to Hashem, more and more I can be sovereign from all of that which I am not. And then you can say the, the three levushim, right? You can see the, the three garments. But my state, more that I cult, for me, more that I cultivate joy in my connection with Hashem and knowing that everything's exactly where it's supposed to be and that, and that I am inexorably, I can never truly die. I can lose this body. I can lose the mind. I can lose the emotional body. But my state does not have to be according to what my sensations, my emotional sensations are. So that I can be sad, I can have a sad sensation, but be happy. That's because great. Because my state can be sovereign for my emotions and my thoughts for that matter. And my physical body being in pain. That's great. I can't help but admire the Ten Commandments behind you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I like them. This is great. So I, I think that we're, 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 we're getting onto something. Should you always be happy? Should, should you be happy at a funeral? Should you be happy when you hear four innocent souls being butchered in a synagogue? Should you be happy when we're hearing all these people who are dying from coronavirus? What does happiness mean? What do we do? We want to define. We want to try to get to a place where happiness makes sense to us. But what does it look like? Let's go back to the middle of page 14, if you're following in your workbook. Considering all this, is true happiness possible? Can anyone claim to be living an ideal life? How can we be happy with what we call mediocrity? Yes, we all have fleeting moments of happiness when we experience an event that is so wonderful that it temporarily blocks out all the other less than ideal aspects of our lives. But to be happy with life itself, that would seem to be the domain of those life forms that lack the ability to dream and imagine. As a society, I believe that we often confuse happiness with acceptance. Someone who accepts their flawed life with a smile, refusing to succumb to depression, and that so often accompanies this emotional state, is considered a quote-unquote happy person. In truth, such a person has successfully reconciled with their lot, realizing that dreams are just that, dreams, but can be accurately described as happiness. I'm okay with it. Flaws and all, garbage and all, the good days, the bad days, and sickness and health, I will be happy. Is that okay? Is that ideal? Is that the quintessential happy person? Is it being realist? Is it being realistic? Is there something more? Is that if we stop the class tonight at this moment right here, what do you say? Okay, that's it. That's reality. There'll be good days, there'll be bad days, but don't worry about it. Some days you're going to wake up yay, and some days you're going to wake up nay, but it'll be okay. We can write poetry now. Good? Okay, sarah, sarah. Just live your life. You'll find the silver lining. Is that good? Are we good now? Can we finish the class? Can we all go? Are you happy with that? No. I am. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems so simplistic. There's, yeah? If something is going, and I, I think Josh was first. I mean, I don't, I, I don't mean, um, maybe you were saying hi to Josh. I don't know. No, I was going to say, I think there's problems in that and being happy all the time. You know, if you have, if you're depressed and you're still happy, 
you might not think it's a problem. You might not get the help you need. You know, if you're laughing at a funeral, you're going against certain norms in society and it's going to make you look really bad and give you a very bad image. So I think it could be problematic in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a good point. I, I agree, but at the same time, if you're at a funeral, that person could not have passed were it not to be God's will. So if you're not going to, and your emotions can be sad. You can be crying, be being in a state of, of still of, of joy, knowing that there is something that is so unfathomably foreverlessly outside of your ability to touch that you know that all is in the right place. And you can't figure it out with your mind. Your mind can't reconcile it. But if you are actually full on upset and your state doesn't stay happy, you're actually arguing with Hashem at all uh, at that time. You're ar even though, because every thought you push out is, it is felt by Hashem. Of course, it's like a vibration, whether I say it or I think it. So an emotion as well. So if I'm actually, listen, I don't know Hashem. I don't know. I love that person. I love hanging out with that person, loving with that person. And I cannot touch why, but there has to be a place of, uh, of me that, oh, that, that stays in ha as untouched by the emotions that I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. It's a great point. I mean, think about it this way. There's always a silver lining. There's always going to be some way of looking at it from a different perspective. Whether it's Michael's perspective, whether it's Josh's perspective, whether it's your own perspective, there's always going to be a way of looking at it. Look at what's going on now. People are spending more time with family, even if it's not physically. People, you know, Alan was sharing that he's called his brothers that he hasn't done in years. You know, people are, are, are doing things that they haven't done before in years. People are telling me about the good deeds they've done. And I say, unfortunately, I don't even know, if, unfortunately, if it's the right word to use, that it's these terrible, horrific times that are bringing out a unity that is absolutely incredible. I mean, if, if that is the reaction that people are having, that's a really good reaction, even though we can't explain what's going on. Because it's our reaction that all, it's all we have anyway. What we truly have control over all is our reaction, how we respond to what happens to us in our life. So I'm not here to define it. But trying to live our lives with this silver lining, are we satisfied with that? Can we go home? It's beautiful. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Olga? Yes. No, I think there's more. It's special. I mean, you have to agree it's special. Josh? Yeah. You agree? Well, I think you have to keep a realistic side of it. I mean, that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah. There's a time to grieve. There's a time to be happy. I mean. There you go. I mean, I think to a certain extent, we can, we, we can stop here. But of course we're not. That, that's the thing, you know, that's something that I think that the gambit of emotions, it's fine to experience them all the time. But there's just a place of uh, uh, within ourselves that is our state, and our emotion and our state is different. Yeah. And it and and, and that's the thing. But we are, we say things like "I am sad," which is impossible. All I can truly be my my amness is love, light, awareness. That's mm -hmm. what I am. Mm -hmm. But I can feel sadness. But our language is completely perverted because we become this body. We become. My my sense. I become my sensation. I I am hungry. I have never ever been hungry. I have never been tired ever. I have never ever ever died. I have never been anything but love light awareness. But I'm having all these in this human experience. I'm having this. My knee hurts. My back hurts. I'm feeling sad. I had this terrible thought. I had this great thought. I became hungry. See, I became hungry. I cannot be hungry. The body can get hungry. The body gets tired. All things that are transient and are not eternal, yeah, they're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But I am always love, light, awareness. And that's what I mean by my state. That's great. 
Yeah. That was Andrew? I think one of the challenges as well to is, is language because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, don't, no, I know you said that you have not defined happiness. And I think that is one of the challenges we are facing at the moment because happiness means, by, by definition, so many things to different people. So we are using the word happiness, yet in each individual's mind, mm -hmm. they are hearing what you are saying, but through the lens of their definition of happiness. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great example. Right? Yeah, and also to, to, to Mike's point, um, the English language is, is, is limited because, on, for instance, uh, like in Spanish, you can make a differentiation between your state and your, your mind because there's ser and estar. You know, the, the ser is who I am, the person, but a star is a, is a fleeting state. So, you know, uh, estoy cansado, or, you know, I am, I'm tired. Yeah. In, that's what you say in Spanish, but you would not say, uh, uh, soy cansado. You know, that does not make sense in Spanish because I cannot be tired but I can be in a state of tiredness, estoy cansado. Oh, wow. So language is also a challenge as well, too. So I don't know how Hebrew would make that differentiation if there is a bigger differentiation when we use the word simcha there is. to represent joy. There is. Simcha is a good example, and we're going to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's Thank my... You. Well, but ani smach is I'm happy. It's like, but there's no am, so... That's right. Never mind. Exactly. You're answering your own questions. Yeah, yes. There's no that was Andrea? It seems we're opposing happiness with loss. Well, in general, we're going to want to use diametrically opposite things to be able to find a balance. We're going to talk about that a little more next week. But yeah, for maybe, maybe for you in this moment, you're, you're seeing that. But we can... use happiness in any context. I've experienced loss in life as, as most people have at some point for a reason or another. It, it was a momentary state mm -hmm. and um, it didn't take away from my overall feeling of fulfillment, maybe instead of happiness in, in where my life was going. Yeah. So that, that's an important point. Uh, to me, that comes back to sort of what I was saying before. It's an acceptance of the situation. Being, being happy, that's that bottom, that, that constant that's always there. An acceptance of the situation, acceptance of life is that people pass away, whether, you know, whether it's by natural causes or otherwise, but people pass away. So it's okay. You can still be happy without being joyous. And so, you know what I mean? Like, your life is still happy because you accept the fact that that's part of life. Uh, it, otherwise, you're living in, a, in a, an unrealistic world. You will never be happy as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Let me, let me share a story with you. A few months ago, before uh, Corona, now we say things like before Corona, I was walking down Monkland. And... <laughs> it's, the, it's the new BC, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> Oh yes, exactly. Thank you. It's the new BC <laughs> before Corona. So I'm walking down Monkland and about 500 meters from me, I could see a lady falls. She falls to the ground. And obviously in that moment, you're in the moment. But when you stop to reflect, I saw three types of people. I saw the people who stopped dead in their tracks. They literally froze, like hands on the side, like they froze. They didn't know what to do. They wanted to help, but didn't know what to do. A couple people just walked by completely ignoring. And then there was this woman who was running around frantic, like screaming, someone help this lady, somebody help this lady. All three of these ways of responding to crisis are wrong. If we stop, if we freeze, we're not going to be able to help anyone. For sure, walking by is not going to help anyone. If you take a look at 
the frontline workers who deal with crisis. Today, they are considered our heroes. Thank God, finally, the world is recognizing them as the true heroes, and they should be recognized as heroes. You're going to see that whenever a crisis happens, this is what they do. And the origins to this are actually in Kabbalah. It says that you stop, you put your hands on your side, and your head down, just for a second. It doesn't have to be more than 10 seconds. Just If you're in a crisis, you're not sure to do, you stop, you put your hands on your side and your head down. And it focuses you. Kabbalah says that you put your head down to concentrate and your head up to be able to remember something. So the best way to respond to crisis is to get into position. Your hands on the side, your head down. And you're going to see that people who do this, they make much better decisions in crisis, or really any time for that matter. It's amazing. If you're working and you have so much commotion around you, like just so much coming at you, and you just stop for a moment and you put your head down, your arms on your side, and you focus, just for a moment, everything changes. So here I am. I'm watching this whole scene unfold in front of me. I was actually pretty far away, 500 meters or so, but I could see what was going on. And when I got there, I didn't have to, but I, I already had done this process as I'm walking, put my head down and, and focus. I already had my phone out. I already had 911 on the phone. And I asked people to step away and not touch her because she fell. And you know, in case she broke something, you're not supposed to touch someone unless you know what you're doing. And I definitely had no idea what I was doing. And the paramedics came shortly after them, took her away. We, we need this very important trait. We need people who are able to focus in times of crisis because crisis is going to happen. Unfortunately, the Israelis have gotten very good at that. A lot of Israelis are perfect. I mean, they know how to focus. They know how to zone in on something. There could be so much noise around them. There could be so frantic, but they know how to zone in. And I'll tell you something very interesting. Kabbalah says that if you're trying to remember something, you put up your head. You actually lean your head up. But you lean your head up to the right. I don't know how it is scientifically, but when you're remembering something, you push your head up and to the right. And when you're trying to imagine something, you push your head up to the left. So I'll give you a little secret. If somebody is talking to you and they say, let me remember that, and they're putting their head up to your right, which is their left, it means they're lying. Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> we put our head up to the right when we're trying to remember, and we put our head up to the left when we're trying to imagine. But if someone's looking at you, it's the opposite. So if, they, if you see someone putting their head up to your right and their left, it means they're lying to you. Just a few little couple of six secrets. There's more than that. But maybe some other time we'll go through some of uh, the Kabbalistic lie detecting. So, so, so here we are. People are, are getting frustrated because... We're equating happiness with loss. We're equating happiness with, with material possessions. We're equating happiness with accomplishments. But the truth is we have to start here because most of us do that. We think of happiness the way we think about physical things. I don't know what you wrote on the paper or in your mind in the beginning of tonight's class, but we often think about physical things. Things we want to do, especially now. Places we want to go. People we want to see. Can't a meaningful, spiritual life be a source of happiness? Well, the spiritual picture isn't rosier. On the contrary, human nature and spirituality are some opposites. 
For the vast majority of people, a self-analysis reveals that the endeavor to be spiritual or to be godly is practically impossible, comparable to a leopard trying to change his spots. And here, I'm going to give you a very simple ingredient in your life, a way of thinking, if you allow me, that will allow you to know whether you're going to be happy or whether you're not going to be. And this is it. I touched on a bit of this in the first lesson, but I want to talk about it and expand on it tonight. It's the difference between being selfish and selfless. Selfish and selfless. Think of anything in your life, an event that happens, anything that you desire, and just try to find if it's selfish or if it's selfless. Think about who you are. Think about where you want to go, what you want to do, your relationships. Think about your business. Is it selfless or is it selfish? This is Kabbalistic secrets to happiness. Nothing is as important in, as this. You're going to find that you could have two things. You want to make money. Kabbalah is going to ask, for what reason? Is it selfish? Do you want to make money for selfish reasons? You'll be depressed. If you want to make money for selfless reasons, you'll be happy. Selfish people are depressed. Selfless people are happy. Let's go a step further. Spirituality is selfless. Human nature is selfish. I put the definition in your book if you see it. Spirituality, godliness, is selflessness. The definition is total commitment to a higher cause, utter revulsion for any act that is detrimental to the higher cause. Human nature, selfishness, the definition I put in your book, commitment to self-gratification, will only renounce a self-gratifying act in favor of something even more self-gratifying, has no concern for any cause other than their own. Kabbalah talks about these two souls within us. There's an animal soul. It's called our natural soul, our instinct. It's not evil. It's just selfish. It wants what it wants when it wants it. It wants to eat. It wants to sleep. And then there's a godly soul, which is actually a piece of God. A chelik elakami, mamish, an actual piece of God that drives us to reach higher, to be more spiritual. Where are these souls within us? Where do they exist? How do we see? Do we see through our eyes? How do we hear? Through our ears? How do we smell through our nose? How do we speak? Do we speak through our lips? If you ever asked someone who had an out-of-body experience, as a rabbi, I get the privilege to hear sometimes about out-of-body experiences. But if you haven't ever heard someone speak, just go on YouTube, there's tons of them. So if you ever hear someone speak about out-of-body experience, they always say the same thing. I could see so clearly. I could see everything. Hold on, wait a second. Are you having an in-body experience or an out-of-body experience? What are you talking about? You can see everything so clearly. And so Kabbalah says that it's not our eyes that see, it's not our ears that hear, it's not our nose that smells. It's our soul that sees and hears. But while our soul is in the body, like a wick to a flame, our soul cannot be connected to this world on its own. It needs the body to be the wick that connects us to this world, the world being the candle. So in order for our soul, for the flame to be connected to the candle, we need the wick, and that's the body. So while our soul is within the body, it uses our eyes and uses our nose and uses our ears. Our soul needs something to hold it within time and space. Our soul, our soul is, is beyond time and space. And so it uses these physical objects to be able to live and function in this world. 
I'm just going to say something, a side point, which I think is fascinating, that all of these, uh, um, all these modalities that the soul uses in this world are all holes. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth. It's the soul looking, the soul hearing. It's it, the soul within, within us is using these holes in our body to express itself. They're all openings. Now, within our soul, again, there, there are two souls. We have the animal soul. Sometimes it's called our natural soul. So we are on a biological level born with this natural soul. It's not evil. It's a natural soul, like an animal. It desires. Ask yourself, why do you eat? Does anyone have a good reason why we eat? I want a fantastic reason why we eat. I want to know. <laughs> yes? I feel, my stomach feels pain when I haven't eaten in a long time. That's why, that's what happens when you don't eat. I want to know why we eat. I want to know the deep meaning and significance of eating. No, I'm saying to, to quell that feeling. So just to quell a feeling. It's, yeah. to, it's to put energy in your body. Put energy in your body. Why do you well, say actually, Yeah? It's to feed your soul. That's why some of us have uh, sometimes... Uh, not compulsive eating, but uh, we eat uh, things that are good and tasty and, and pleasant, not because we're hungry, but we need to feel the soul. We need I'm, to... I'm totally with you. Some of us have big souls. <laughs> I get it. Especially when it comes to good food. The, the, the point is, is that we really can't answer the question. I mean, we can feel it. We can talk about feelings all day and all night. We can write poetry on it. But we really can't answer the question because there's no brain in our hearts. There's really no way to understand primal needs. So Kabbalah gives us a way to attempt to make sense of primal needs. We have a primal soul. It's like an animal. It's no different than an animal. If we don't do anything, if we're passive our entire lives, we still have to be an animal. Which means if we don't accomplish, if we don't work, if we don't even get out of our beds, we still have to eat and sleep and go to the bathroom. The same way an animal does. So we could, if we want to, passively or maybe even actively, choose to be an animal. It's the natural part of us. It's obvious. It's our nature. It's, it's who we are. We are primal. We like that steak the same way an animal is devouring its meat. But then there's a second soul within us. There's the godly soul. The godly soul is that part of us that wants to rise higher. It wants to accomplish. It wants to be successful. It wants to make this world a better place. There's one basic difference. Our primal nature is selfish. Our godly is selfless. And that's how you know if what you're doing is primal or if what you're doing is godly. By asking yourself, is it selfish or is it selfless? Kabbalah says there's actually a physical place where the souls live. You ever hear this before? There's a physical place where the souls live. There's a physical place within the body where these two souls actually live. The primal soul, the animal soul, lives in the left ventricle of the heart. What does the left ventricle of the heart do? It pumps the blood. Is there any part of your body without blood? So it makes sense when we say the primal soul is our nature. Because just like the blood is everywhere, the primal soul is everywhere. It uses the blood to get around. Where is the divine soul? The divine soul, the godly soul, is in the brain. Mind over matter. Mind over heart. Your mind should dominate your heart. Think about this. Let's talk about a, a physical manifestation of this piece of Kabbalah. 
what happens when we get angry? When we get angry, our left ventricle pumps the blood faster to the brain. And you can literally watch the blood rising to the brain and the face getting red. It's the primal soul taking over the godly soul physically. You can literally see the animal taking over the godly in real life. Here's another very important way that you can know that it's animalistic. If you have to have it, if you have to have it, I have to have this. My kids say it all the time. What do you mean I have to have this? There's nothing that you have to have. Nothing. There's a beautiful uh, old uh, adage from, from the old country, from the shtetl. It says in Yiddish the following. It says, Vas metarnished, tarmanished. Aber vas memeg, darfmanished. Which translates like this. What you can't have, you can't have. But what you can have, you don't need. So, just to recap. Ask, is it selfish or selfless? And number two, do I need it? And if I need it, think twice. Because there's nothing that you need. People can survive three days without food, or maybe even more. Need is a very powerful word. Now let's go to desire. The reason why it's so... Very quick... Yes. May I ask a very quick question here? Yeah. Sure. Um... All right, you're saying that the primal or the animal soul lives in the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. So what happens when people do get a heart transplant? <laughs> There's still a soul. They don't get a new soul. It's still there. So the, the, the animal soul takes the new heart. Okay. S it's so... not like out with the heart, out, out with the animal soul. That would, okay, that would be great. Right. That would be a great idea. <laughs> say that's a heart patient. <laughs> Okay, all right. So let's go to desire. I think the reason why it's so complicated for us to be able to really understand this is because there's no brain in the heart. It's emotions that we're trying to define. So what Kabbalah wants us to do is to kind of give us pointers so that when we're gravitating towards something, we can take a step back. It's the same reason why we don't know why we sleep. We don't know why we eat. We don't know why we desire. We don't know why our impulse pushes us towards that particular thing. And what Kabbalah says is question the impulse. Question the impulse. It may be a good thing. It may be the right thing. Just question it first. It may take a total of 10 seconds to question it. But question, think about it. I don't watch too much TV, but every so often, if I am somewhere and I see a TV, uh, these commercials, I mean, they just kind of stick out at me. I'm like gravitating towards, yes, I need Dove shampoo. I really, wow, Dove shampoo. I mean, that's the one I need. Tide, Tide, it's going to make my clothes cleaner. I could see like, you know that stain that I can't stand on my shirt? I see it tied. It's going to make my clothes cleaner. I mean, look at the, the, the cereals, the way the glue, I mean, the way the milk is so perfectly poured in the commercial. There are millions of dollars that are spent trying to get our money. They're spending millions of dollars to get our money. The, you paid for the ad that sold you the product that you bought. Just think about it a second. So what Kabbalah says, ever before marketing geniuses, Kabbalah knew that one day we would live in a world where we would have 3,000 messages hitting us a day. 3,000 advertising messages hitting us from all directions. You literally can't move today without an advertiser hounding you. Kabbalah knew we would need this, that we would need this information more than any generation in history, that we'll have to be able to differentiate and understand desire and emotion. 
So remember, number one, selfish or selfless. And number two, question the impulse. And now let's go back to our book, the last paragraph of 15. Almost absurdity, the human being, the crown jewel of creation is the only creature that possesses this anti-spiritual nature. All other creations, from the most celestial angel to the lowly earthworm, do exactly what their creator wants of them and have no desire whatsoever to stray one iota from their divine mission. Imagine this. Imagine you created a table. You did it. You worked on it. You took a piece of wood. You cut it down from the tree like a good wood chopper. And then you started to sand it and you uh, varnished it and you cut it to size. And then you made, you fashioned this beautiful table. It was amazing. A real craftsman. You put in these really nice bolts into the legs and you put it all together. And then you finish the table and you're about to take your dinner and sit down to your newly fashioned table. The table looks at you and says, nice knowing you see around. I've got people to see, things to do, places to go. There's a world out there. I'll be going now. And you watch the table walk right by you. You're like, dude, ski, I just made you. You belong to me. Where are you going? What is this world out there? I'll see you later. What does that mean? I think that parents have an appreciation for this because they, ha they, they have these children and then they raise them from infancy. They, they change their diapers. And then at one point, the child says, okay, I got a world to see. See you later. But that's what God did to us. And it's only through parenting that we can truly appreciate God because God took one creation in all the cosmos, one creation, and put within that creation a desire to do anything, which means this creation could leave. This creation can say, God, you don't even exist. This creation can question God, can do virtually anything. And that's one creature, that's us. Every other creature, every other animal, every other species, every worm, everything, has the ability to do exactly what God said and nothing else. Only the human being can do something against its creator. It can be like the table standing up and say, see you later. Oh, and by the way, I don't believe you ever made me. That's free choice. We really have the ability to deny God like a table. God says, here, and you're like, yeah, whatever. You never made me anyway. What do you mean? <laughs> and God, like the, the, like, the, like the furniture maker, is like, I've been working on you for three years. You're my baby. Nah, you never made me. Yeah, right. You made me? Okay. You know, there was a big bang, and all of a sudden, all the tables appeared. It was amazing. You know, there was a, a big explosion and all the tables came into existence. The, there was, a, there was a, a guy that came to Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, the previous Rebbe. And he said, uh, can you explain creation? And uh, he said, no. He said, come on, don't you believe there was a big bang? He's like, yeah, I believe there's a big bang. A bottle of ink spilled and turned into a book. That's evolution. That's what the previous Rebbe said. It's an amazing idea that God did. And we have to appreciate creation. That's what a, a higher power, to understand that God literally made us with free choice, that we can choose any way we want. And why are we sitting here? We're sitting here trying to educate ourselves, trying to understand which way to choose but we could only choose if we know how to choose, if we know what to choose. 
And here's how we finish off today. You go back to your books. The next part of page 16. So we can be happy with our spiritual identity and nature. It can be argued that such contentment only serves to dangerously bolster and legitimize our egotistical natures. We haven't answered the most powerful, the most important question. We're on the road. We understand some of the ingredients, but we still don't know. I don't want to leave you here tonight until I've told you how to attain happiness. Where does true happiness come from? And here, I'm going to quote you exactly what Rabbi Shneur Zaman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe says in chapter 31 of Tanya. This is how he explains achieving happiness. If you have a book, you can follow along with me. In order to comfort his heart in double measure, let him say to his heart, indeed, without a doubt, I am far removed, utterly remote from God. I am despicable, contemptible, and so on. But all this is true only of me, that is, my body and the animating soul within it. Yet within me, there's a veritable part of God, namely the divine soul and the spark of godliness. Clothed in it, animating it. It is only that divine soul is in exile because it inhibits such a lowly body. Therefore, I will make my entire aim and desire to extricate it from this exile, to return her to her father's home as in her youth. That is, as it was before being clothed in my body, when it was completely absorbed in God's light and united with him. Now too will it likewise be absorbed and united with him once again when I concentrate all my aspirations on the Torah and the mitzvot. This then should be one's lifelong service of God with great joy. The joy of the soul upon leaving the loathsome body and returning during one's study of the Torah and the service of God to her father's house as in her youth. Surely there's no joy as great as that of being released from exile and captivity. I'm going to finish off with a little story. A couple of years ago, I was able to witness something absolutely incredible. I've spoken about this to some of you before, but I spent a year working for the Olive Institute in the United States under the federal prison system. And I went as a volunteer chaplain from prison to prison. I met incredible prisoners. I spoke with them. I even met once a man on death row. I'll tell you that story a different time. And one day, I was in a prison, and the, the chaplain said to me, will you be our guest? And I said, uh, guest? I mean, I guess, am I a guest? I don't know. No, 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 no. He said, we have um, a special event tonight. It's, a, it's about to happen. We're having a high school graduation. There are prisoners who never graduated high school. And the federal system started a new program that they're able to get their GED, their high school equivalency, in the prison system. This is a, an effort to try to rehabilitate them. And we have a graduation today. Would you be interested in attending the graduation? I'm always up for something incredible. So I'm like, yes, absolutely. But I had no idea what I was about to witness. And there it is. I walk in. And I'm sitting there watching this graduation, watching the scene. I'll never forget the scene. There's this big guy, tattoos everywhere. He's like, he's big. And this guy, he's like one of those guys you don't want to meet in a dark alley. And I can't even imagine why he's in prison. I don't even want to know. And he's running off the stage and he gives his little mom this big hug, he like picks her up in his arms and he says, mom, I did it, I did it, I did it, I graduated. Holding up his diploma like it was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Here's a man 
that never imagined in his whole life that he would graduate high school. And he's holding up a high school diploma in such an excitement, like a, like a, like a young boy. And he gets up and says, this is the greatest day of my life. I could see it in their eyes. They may have been in prison, but for those few seconds during that graduation, these prisoners were released. They were free because of what happened at that moment. And you could see it. They went from being prisoners to endless possibilities because now they had a diploma. And now they could go to university. And he screams across, I'm leaving, you know, my time is up in four months and I'm going to university. Then there was one night, it was Rosh Hashanah. I was at the prison, the federal prison in Homestead, Florida. And usually um, I was able to stay in a motel or somewhere near the prison, or I had a camper. It happens to be Homestead, Florida, for those of you who don't know, was completely decimated by Hurricane Andrew in the 90s. And the only building that was still standing in the entire homestead was the federal prison. And so there was nowhere to stay in this Rosh Hashanah, and I'm not going to drive, obviously. So they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know, you have an extra cell somewhere? So the, the chaplain there says to me, you, you understand what you understand what you're asking. You know, if you stay in a cell, we have to treat you as a prisoner during that time that you're in the cell, which means if there's a lockdown or anything happens, you're a prisoner. I'm like, okay, how bad could it be? It's like, you're crazy. I'm like, okay, I've been called worse. So we finish our service and I go back to my cell. And of course, one of the prisoners tries to escape at two o'clock in the morning. And we were on lockdown for 12 hours. Now, I'm not sure if you know what lockdown is. If you haven't ever experienced lockdown, let me tell you, because I experienced lockdown. The lights are off. You're barred shut. You can't do anything. You can't see anything. It's just you and your thoughts for 12 hours. That's it. You can't talk. You can't scream. There's guards everywhere. All you hear is the, the clingling of the keys and your thoughts. When it was all over, I go back to the showroom. Everybody was quiet. And I never saw, you know, prison is like a boys club to a certain extent, especially the men's prisons. And there was like a certain certain sense of uh, camaraderie that we had after that with the prisoners, because I'm sure there's a lot of rabbis that came through there and a lot of chaplains they had met, but nobody that lived through what they have to live through. And I never experienced that freedom, just that 12 hours. I can't imagine how prisoners can do it for longer than that, but just to be able to experience that level of lockdown, and then being free, it's such a, an incredible experience. I, mean, I wanted to leave, I wanted so badly to leave. And even though I was a rabbi, and even though I didn't belong there, that was it. They told me if anything happens, I'd be a prisoner. That experience of being free, that's happiness. So often, we create prisons for ourselves. We lock ourselves down. We put ourselves in lockdown. We create these superficial prisons around us. I can't do this. It's not possible. It's done. It's over. The Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Schneer Zalman, he says, being free, freedom, is not doing whatever you want. Freedom is understanding that you can control your desires. That people who say they're out of control, they're not out of control. You are able to control your emotions. Kabbalah says a person who controls their desires will be free from ever, from everything.
It's hard. It's difficult. But if you want to talk about two opposites, talk about the mind and the heart. If we're able to follow this adage and allow our mind to hone our heart, we're just talking 51 to 49. I mean, imagine if I gave this class without any heart. My gosh, it would be like monotone. But we need to be able to hone the heart. Don't respond by impulse. Take a step back. Sometimes you have to take a step physically back, but take a step back. So, number one, selfish or selfless? Number two, anyone? Question the impulse. Do I need it? Do I need it? Question the impulse. And number three, freedom. Desire. The ability to control our emotions, the ability to control our desires. That is the Kabbalistic recipe for happiness. And that's my talk for tonight.